God bless you, saints, and greetings in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a pleasure to be serving the bread of Christ once again and to be sharing the word of God with you. It is the 29th of September, 2021. We are dealing with demonology as our series. This is part 23, God of this Evil Age, part 6. And for a title, The Biggest Cover-Up in the World. The biggest cover-up in the world. We want to take a scripture reading from 2 Kings 9 and verse 30 and Ezekiel 23 verse 40 to 45. So let's read in the word of God and may God add a blessing to his word. 2 Kings 9 verse 30. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it and she painted her face and tired her head and looked out at a window. Ezekiel 23, 45. And furthermore, that you have sent for men to come from far, unto whom a messenger was sent, and lo, they came, for whom thou didst wash thyself, paintest thy eyes, and deckest thyself with ornaments, and settest upon a stately bed, and a table prepared before it, whereupon thou hast set mine incense and mine oil. And a voice of multitude being at ease with her and with the men of the common sort were brought Sabians from the wilderness, which put bracelets upon their hands and beautiful crowns upon their heads. Then said I unto her that was old in adulteries, will they now commit whoredoms with her and she with them? Yet they went in unto her as they go in unto a woman that playeth the harlot. So went they in unto Ahola and unto Aholiba, the lewd woman. And the righteous men, they shall judge them after the manner of adulteresses and after the manner of women that shed blood, because they are adulteresses and blood is in their hands. Amen. So also to begin, I want to read this quote from God of this Evil Age, because this is the book that we are studying that brings out us um, this part of demonology. And we want to get to what the cover-up is as um, soon as possible, as quick as we can. And in other words, just say it from the beginning. Paragraph 116, God of this Evil Age. The prophet says, Notice how Satan got that scientific age back there of Noah's. Now, this is important to notice the similarity, the parallel that is being used, which is the day of Noah. Okay, let's continue reading. To lean upon their own understanding. In other words, he got that generation, that scientific generation to lean upon their own understanding. All right, so drawing that parallel. Huh? He says, the Bible tells us in Proverbs, lean not to your own understanding. And let every word, every man's word be a lie and God's be true. But Satan, by his knowledge from beginning at the Garden of Eden, got the people to lean upon their own understanding. And you know, through his great Max Factor's works that he had back there, he got women so fair that it caused the sons of God rather to fall to sin and marry them. Right? Woman was so fair, so pretty. Now, he makes a statement here. He got that great Max Factor's works that he had back there. Now, he's talking about Noah's day. And he's using something that was in his present, which is Max Factor, which we'll talk about just now. And he says that was happening in Noah's day, right? So this is an important thing to understand, and that's why we want to look at it under the series of, under the subject of demonology. And so, um, without sugarcoating it, we begin. This session of demonology is about the beauty of women. Now, I know that some people will heave a sigh and go, Oh, there they go again beating that old dead horse of the Branamites, you know, speaking against women. Everything is against women. So I'd like to say this from the start. I know there might be people listening to this who probably are not the message or 
not a part of our church or maybe from a different place or understanding. I want to say this to you from the start. In case you've heard some really ridiculous things about what we believe. And I also want to say this to this new generation of young people coming up. Uh, maybe some of you don't know me. It doesn't matter whether you know me. It doesn't matter whether you... Uh, or you don't need to know me. I'm nobody important. But because it's me speaking on this audio, I'd like to confess something to you. I am no stupid. I am no religious zealot. I am not brainwashed by anyone or any dogma of a church or a following. And I have a perfectly healthy thinking brain. I can really think for myself. My faith is in the word of God and in truth. Right? So let's clear that. I'm not, I'm not a Branhamite. I'm not controlled by anybody. Nobody spoon-fed me stuff from the time I was a child. My parents didn't do that to me. I was grown up a free-thinking person. I criticize everything I see in the world based on the truth that I receive. And that truth is from the Word of God. So, having said that, it isn't a mystery that women have been one of the three biggest downfalls to men since the Garden of Eden. Now, we know the things that can really cripple a man, break him down, reduce him to nothing in this world, is money, women, and popularity. You know, women don't even have those weaknesses. You're, it's very rare that women will have a weakness for men, that they will put everything, their families, their children, uh, you know, they're at in jeopardy just for a man. It's very rare. There's very few women, but almost all men. Uh, you know, will fall to either all three of these things or one of them. And it takes the Holy Ghost in a man to keep him safe from these things. Money, women, and popularity. Particularly men of the ministry. Men of my vocation. So, to say that again... It's not a mystery. It's not rocket science. It's not something that just came up with, with Brother Branham. It's not something that just came up in this day. Women have been the, one of the three biggest downfalls to men since the Garden of Eden. We have non-Christian stories, histories of men, mythology. You know, the story of um, Troy and Greece and, you know, of, of men doing the most idiotic things for the love of a woman, including destroying countries Myths and legends were written and, you know, countries were formed and destroyed because of a man's love for a woman. Dynasties were destroyed. Dynasties in the East, in China, uh, emperor, uh, emperors and, and, and kings lost their lives. And just for women, just because they loved someone, they could not be satisfied with the wife they had, so they would jeopardize their own kingdoms just for the love of a woman? Is it the fault of the woman? Obviously not. But that's what is important to understand. Women will be one of the biggest downfalls of men in the last days. But even worse, she will be one of the biggest downfalls of the Christian church. Now, that's a hard statement. And, you know, Women in this world do not enjoy those statements. Women in modern churches don't enjoy those statements. But it's true. Again, I want to make it clear that my statement is not placing the blame on the woman. It's demonology. But again, it's important that we understand it how and why. I'm sure someone will be screaming, How can he say, you know, women are demonology? I'm not saying women are demonology. Right? We've spoken a whole lot in the series of demonology and showed how it affects men, how it comes in through men behind the pulpits. I've spoken enough about men. I've spoken enough about people in general concerning demonology and how it affects them. This is something we need to admit as a society. It's demonology. Right? So we'd like to understand how and why. And the prophet of the hour pointed it out to us that this is what was happening. So, and most Christian churches, you know, one of the main reasons they don't like hearing 
the ministry of the message is because they feel they claim it's sexist, it's misogynist, it's against women, and it doesn't give women equal rights. And, and it's all false because that's not what the message does. Denominational people and worldly people say such awful things about the message and the prophet because they do not take the time to understand the conditions of the day in which he spoke those things. So let's put you in the picture. Brother Branham was born in 1909. Okay, At that time, America was still a nation that respected God. Churches believed in holiness and they were conservatively dressed. They were conservative in dress and attitude in church. Right? You, I mean, at that time, you wouldn't even have men smoking on the church property, drinking, or they wouldn't have parties in the church halls. They wouldn't have, uh, you know, games and, and, and gambling and dances in the basement of churches. They would never have had those things. This was the time of the Azusa Street revival in America. There was holiness involved. Not only the church, right? But so they believed at that time the church was a holy place. You know, at one time, maybe 500 years ago, uh, when people believed in witches and witchcraft and wizardry in the, in the dark forests of Germany and, um, you know, of, of Europe and England. And uh, the churches were actually believed to have been holy ground so that somebody who, you know, I don't know, maybe they just had some psychological breakdown and they believed that person was demon-possessed and the whole village would run away from a person and take shelter in the church because they believed the devil could not stand across the gates of the church. So they literally believed that. So what I'm saying is that at some time in history, people believed that the church ground was holy and they hallowed that ground so much they wouldn't allow... Any abomination, anything that looked or smelled unholy in any way. I'm trying to describe it such that to show you how much people revered the church, how much they felt the church was holy, right up to the time of the Azusa Street Revival in 1906 in Los Angeles. Um, Whether they were Catholic, whether they were Protestant churches, they were deemed holy places, right? And the people came in dressed in holy manner. They wouldn't even wear work clothes to church. They had what was called Sunday clothes. And then the rest of the clothes were work clothes for the week. They would not come to church in work clothes because that's how they hallowed the place. That's how much they uh, respected the church. And, And this is not message churches. This is the original Christian churches today. Uh, that have become uh, the original Christian churches of that day, the original Methodist, the original Lutheran, the original Pentecost, the original Assemblies of God, the original uh, 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 Presbyterian, the original Anglican, all these people, they were the original holiness churches. And if you look at them today, you wouldn't recognize them. Right? So I don't know how the message churches have become labeled, Well, I know how, I just don't see it as logical that the same people of denominations are criticizing the message when they were the ones in 1906, 1909, 1920, criticizing Hollywood and the other people. It was their denominations that were criticizing the Pentecostals for being unholy. I just showed you how it flips around, right? So anyway... The churches believed at that time that the church was a holy place. And the people believed the churches were a holy place. And the churches, Methodist, Anglican, Presbyterian, Pentecostals, the whole lot, Catholic and Protestant, they were against Hollywood. They were against Broadway. They preached against it. They had just started Hollywood at that time in the... the, the Turn of the century, the early 1900s, before even 1920, Hollywood was just becoming a sensation among city people. The rest of America were not interested. Actors in Hollywood were, were, were paid tuppence. They, they didn't earn much of a living. They had no adver- 
uh, advertising to make them great uh, people. They were not stars. They were not celebrities. They were your regular uh, drunkards and, uh, you know, people addicted to things. Uh, regular lecherous people barely making a living. That's what Hollywood began as. Uh, church, church women and women of all races at that time wore long dresses to the floor. Now we're talking about not just America. If you move to Europe, it was the same in England. If you move to Germany and France during the early 1900s, all the way through to the Middle East, through to China, through to India, women wore dresses to the floor. So we're looking at the, the beginning of the 1900s, right? Church women, cultural women, wore blouses that buttoned up to the neck while they felt, all the religious people of the world and all the lords and ladies, felt that only scandalous women wore low-cut blouses where you could see the cleavage of a woman, see-through garments were, were scandalous, form-fitting garments were scandalous, and all revealing clothes. This wasn't even just Christian dressing. All societies, non-Christian societies, at that time had that form of dressing. Women who used, to, who used heavy makeup were considered stage actresses or prostitutes. In the 1900s. So, you know, people who think Brother Branham made this up, they just don't know their history. They're just really silly people who don't understand, don't even take the time to read the histories of people. So the history of prostitutes. Prostitutes used to cover up, used makeup to cover up their identities because they didn't want people to know who they were. So they laid on heavy makeup to change their looks, change their eyes, change their lips, change the color of their skin. They use makeup to hide their identities and also to make them look like a novelty that was more alluring, sexualizing themselves to make sure they get business from men. This was not seen as the behavior of decent women. Women at that time would not be wearing thick makeup. But within two decades, everything went to hell. 1914 to 1918 brought World War I. With that came the flu pandemic and economic depression that led to the Great Depression of 1929 to 1939. During those two decades, European economies crashed from costs of the wars and funding to America stopped. The stock market crashed in 1929. Banks went into panic. Unemployment went up to about 25%. International trade dropped by about 50%. The majority of people in middle class and low income America were unemployed and struggling for food. So what happens when economic depression takes place? Well, mental depression sets in, right? So what happened was men took to alcohol, women took to smoking. Or men took to alcohol and smoking. And soon, men and women were spending more time in bars, having no work, day and night, spending time in bars. What happens when that takes place? Sexual immorality began to increase. More and more children were born out of wedlock. Television was being invented during this time and introduced into the homes. Hollywood had devised ways, now seeing the depression of the people, Hollywood devised ways to entertain. They brought in comedians, late night shows, uh, and sexualized everything. They started joking about sexuality. They started bringing in curse words uh, to entertain the people and raise the morale of the nation. And this nation was founded on Christianity, right? On Judeo-Christian values. Now, then came World War II. In World War II, while the men were fighting away, rock and roll emerged as a rebellion against Christianity and against the government of America. Men of America went off to war. When they returned, those that did return alive, returned to see their wives had committed adulteries and were dressed like Hollywood actresses. They were enjoying rock and roll, smoking and drinking, spending time in bars, 
dressing in mini skirts, revealing blouses and bobbing their hair like schoolboys. This was a culture that conservative society was not ready for. And bear in mind, saints, this is the time that Brother Branham's ministry had picked up. This is the time that God chose to place this prophet, Billy Graham, all Roberts, A. A. Allen, all these men that were in that time speaking out against sin. This is the time. It was not just a prophet. It was all these great men at that time speaking out against sin. The only thing is, Brother Branham did not compromise. Right? All the others who preached out against it in the campaigns eventually just let people into their churches who dressed however they want to, live however they want to, smoke, drink, fornicate, adulteries, let them all in. And that's why the churches broke down in spirituality. Now, so this was the culture and that conservative society was not ready for. It was caused by Hollywood, rock and roll, and the two world wars that came in that brought the people into Great Depression. So during that time, a company called Max Factor, which Brother Branham speaks about and criticizes, and other companies that produce women's cosmetics. Remember, women's cosmetics became a new thing, right? It, it was never something that was given to public. Uh, women's cosmetics was either given, and, and they were mostly in the forms of like talcum powders. We're talking about 500 years ago. And maybe some perfumes and uh, powders maybe to color their cheeks red. In case you didn't know, that which is called rouge. Uh, it's a scientific fact that when a woman is sexually aroused, blood rushes to her cheeks, creating the reddish pinkish hue in her cheeks. Uh, which is why in the old um, um, picture stories, where whether it was Japanese or the Eastern way, or Chinese or Indians and many of the people who drew stories, they would draw beautiful women with these red circles on their cheeks. It wasn't because of anything else, but because at that time it was perceived that if a woman had sexual interest in you, her cheeks would be rosy, which is why you would find European women would often, when they were about to meet men, they would pinch their cheeks because if they were too pale, they felt that they were not attractive enough. So Max Factor in America and these places began to produce powders, paints, for women to change the colors of their skin and their eyes and uh, to make them look alluring and to make men think they are attractive and interested sexually in them there was no uh, there was no other agenda for creating makeup face paints eyeshadows mascara there was no other there was, there was no other agenda the only agenda of the original making of these things creations of these things was to make women sexualized okay so, you know, I do understand that today, uh, you know, the all women in some form, you know, use uh, some form of makeup. They just, it's become a thing that, you know, I must say they've even tried to make it normal where all a woman is using is just powder maybe to absorb, you know, moisture from her face or, you know, it, it's it's so strange because today we've got white women who want to be browner, black women who want to be whiter, lighter in color. Everybody is not happy with the way they look. So there's a there's a cosmetic line for every single woman who's not happy with the way she looks. And basically every woman is not happy with the way she looks. It's incredible. So, you know, the, don't talk about Max Factor. I mean, I can't even name the number of names that we have. You just walk into to Edgar's in the Pavilion Mall here near where I am. And uh, I, I literally... Um, because I got such a strong sense of smell, I literally have to hold my breath because the smell of the of the cosmetics hits you so hard. By the time I pass through it, I'm sneezing. But that's how many different companies there are. If you just walk in at the doors, you get hit with this smells of cosmetics and perfumes. And it's incredible how many thousands and thousands, millions are spent on this just to make sure women know 
they are not attractive as they are, but they need help from the cosmetic chain stores. <laughs> it's incredible. So, you know, this company called Max Factor and other companies began to advertise in Brother Branham's day that regular women could look like actresses if they used all this heavy makeup. So Max Factor was a cosmetic chain of stores or brand or something of the sort in those days. And here in this message in God of this evil age and, and a few others, Brother Branham is bringing in the way that Satan has, through science, engineered a way to make all women look much more attractive and sexualized. It was the greatest cover-up of truth of that time. Why? Because when a woman uses all these things to cover up everything about her, she's basically not that person. And I mean, it's, it's, it's probably like the greatest shock. I feel really sorry for men who marry women who use incredible amounts of um, makeup. Because every night when she comes to bed, she's got to clean off all that makeup. Which means during the day, she's dressed in a skin-tight clothes. She's made up like a porcelain doll. But when you meet her in your bed at night, she takes all that off and then you see her who she really is. So, you know, when she's flirting with you outside in the world and she's all dolled up, she's all made up. So it's, you know, and then you, you're dealing with the hormones of men. You're, you're messing with the pheromones. You're messing with the scents, the perfumes. You're messing with the, the chemistry of men. And then you make them attracted to you now, now, just think about that. Women of this world agree with that. And uh, so when they come to, to be with their husbands and they take off all the stuff, all the makeup, all the paints, all the eyelashes, all the mascara, all the lipstick, they take it all off and then they stand there before their husbands and suddenly their husbands are looking at somebody who they can't even recognize because now they're seeing all your freckles, all your pimples, all your, you know, um, idiosyncrasies and irregularities and um, not perfect eyes and not perfect lips and not plum red and I don't know what colors you might have. Uh, and, and then you want your husband to be attracted to you when during the day you're putting up all of this attraction for other men of course, women say they do it for themselves. I don't believe that. Um, but then you wonder why the men of this world leave their homes at night to go sleep with other painted-faced women. Right? I mean, it's common sense. It's common sense. Men are not used to seeing natural women anymore. Right? Right? Which is why they are, they, they are trained in their minds. I mean, you show it to them on movies. You show it to them in magazines. All the women, I mean, today, it's, it's so amazing. The, the, the actual models and, and uh, women of, on, on screens and so on are no longer using makeup because they, re they recognize how makeup is destroying their faces. So they have computer software now which uh, actors and actresses don't and, and models don't have to use it because the, f the photographers are able to give them perfect smooth skin by using computer programs to smudge their faces and so on. So, but in the meantime, the, the, the max factors of the world today are telling the people, you can look like actresses. All you got to do is use our products, use our skin cleansers, our toners, our, our you know, I don't know what face paints there are and, and, and so on. So you can look like them. You don't have to eat healthy and exercise and, you know, uh, you can eat whatever you want to. But don't worry, we got you. We can do up your face for you. It's lies. It's demonology. And women of the world are being duped into this kind of behavior and don't realize it. Right? So, listen, saints, you may not like the truth. It was the biggest cover up of truth at the time and women are still being lied to today and of course the ones who are who are targeted are the men by demonology they, they're targeted by demonology so you may not like the truth but it is simply what it is according to history the mentality of men at that time 1929 1930 1940s 1950s the mentality of men was not ready for all women looking so highly sexualized 
Let me put you in the picture. If you were a boy who was growing up on a farm, let's say in, in America, I don't know, maybe in Ohio, right? The closest pretty girl to you was like five miles away on another farm, okay? And then you go to the city and all the girls there are dressed in their normal, you know, brown, beige, working frocks. And they're working as washerwomen, waitresses. There was no, you know, the high class secretaries, skin tight skirts with high heels, stilet or stilettos. You know, that came later in Chicago and New York City and so on. That came later after all this nonsense had come in. So can you imagine the men of those countries moving to the cities to work and now seeing all these women who were uh, basically liberal and set free by, by the women's liberation movement and influenced by Hollywood and meeting all these women in the bars and clubs and lounges. And these young men who came from conservative backgrounds in, in Ohio and the Midwest and all of those places and suddenly coming to these cities where, they ha where all the industrialization was taking place, what do you think happened? Sexual immorality increased, rapes increased, teenage pregnancies increased, and soon the American society began its decay to the cesspool and disgrace to its founding fathers that it is today. America is an actual, an absolute disgrace uh, in its morality, in its society, it is absolutely not an example for any society in the world today. The chain reaction as women had lost their conservativeness was catastrophic. More children were being born in the streets. More homes became single parent homes. Crime increased exponentially. More young boys joined gangs and chose a life of crime in low income neighborhoods. And that, that has perpetuated itself till today. You go to Chicago today, you go to New York today and go to the low-income neighborhoods and all you've got is boys in gangs losing their lives every single day. The crime rate in Chicago is higher. The, the, the amount of killings, can you believe it? We live in South Africa and yet Chicago's killings, the, the percentage of boys being killed in Chicago is higher than South Africa. And those people criticize us. It's a joke, right? More young boys join gangs there and choose a life of crime in these neighborhoods. So again, was it the woman's fault? No, it was demonology, all demonology, weaponizing the beauty of the woman against mankind. And it isn't stopping today, saints. Now, our concern is, you know, I asked the question to, to my Christian brothers, Fine, the women are doing that. What is your problem? Why are you falling for this kind of woman? Why are you falling for this kind of thing? Of course, I know the reason. All I'm doing is trying to put some conviction in their heart. Right? Why would you be even looking at a character like that when you know what that character is influenced by? Where it's coming from? Right? So, this is what's happening. Increasing sexual beauty, right? Let's have a look at it. Paragraph 117, Brother Bram says, Now you take the ordinary woman on the street today. A lot of you has read the story. He says, you never heard of it because it's before my days. So he talks about this one beautiful woman called Pearl O'Brien. He says, Pearl O'Brien, how many ever heard of her? Sure, she was supposed to be the world's most beautiful woman. Why, there ain't a school kid that goes in the schoolhouse today, but what's twice as pretty as she was? Why is it? The beauty of women is to happen in the last days. So in other words, Brother Bram is saying, there was this woman, Pearl O'Brien, who was before even his time, and she was supposed to be the most beautiful woman. What he's saying here is that almost every single school kid in a schoolhouse in his day was more beautiful than Pearl O'Brien. He's asking, how did that happen? Right? And he says, it was prophesied that this should happen in this day. He says, they've cut their hair, they made them 
put them in little girls' dresses. They put shorts and bikinis, ever what you call them. They put paint and rouge and all these kind of things to make them something that they're not. But through scientific knowledge, they've been able to achieve this. Do you know there's more spent for cosmetics for women than there is in the United States twice or three times as much as spent for food to live on? Now, that's a fact of that day. Right? You know, in the 1950s, 1960s, there was shortage of food. There wasn't McDonald's. They didn't have all these other chain stores spending money on food like they do today. But at that time, the scientific world was spending more on cosmetics for women to improve the look of women than was being spent to feed the hungry. Brother Ram says, prove that that's right for cosmetics. So even the words make up expresses how much of a lie it really is, right? Now you remember our theme, anything that is a lie is demonology. The biggest cover up in the world is a modern day woman's face that you see on a magazine or a billboard somewhere and you see a, a woman who is advertising for a car or for a bank loan or whatever. The face that you see in that picture is not that woman's real face. The only time you see that woman's real face is when she washes her face before she goes to bed that night. And she doesn't realize that it's just a big lie. It's the biggest cover-up in the world today, right? Covering the face with a veil in the old days was a sign of marriage. Covering the face with paint to change one's original appearance was a sign of prostitution. In the Middle East, in the Bible. All right, let's give you some proof. Genesis 38, 15 says, When Judah saw her, he thought her to be an harlot because she had covered her face. All right, so you say, no, no, that means, you know, they had that string veil with those, you know, strings falling down over the eyes and the beads hanging down there. And, you know, that, that's not makeup. All right, let's go to Jezebel religion. If you remember the scriptures we read in the beginning, 2 Kings 9 to 30, showing how that this woman, Jezebel, when, she, when Jehu was coming to judge her, she painted her face and tired her head, meaning she... She decorated her hair and, and, and dressed her hair to make it appealing. And why did she do that? This is putting this together with the spirit of this evil woman Jezebel. This is the reason the Bible uses the symbol of Jezebel as a demonic enemy spirit against the church. Let's read Revelations 2.18. And unto the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know thy works in charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel. Now the word sufferest means you allow. Because you allow that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication. Who is my servants? The ministers of the church. To commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, you know the book of Revelation is a book of symbols. So this is all symbolic prophecy of what should happen in the 2,000 years after Christ. The church ages. And to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Verse 21. And I gave her space to repent of a fornication. In other words, I gave this church... This woman Jezebel is a church, right? I gave her space to repent of her fornication. So she was involved in fornication. So how is the church involved in fornication? And she repented not. Verse 22. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. All right, so what's this prophecy talking about? Notice, he's speaking using a symbol and the symbol is Jezebel. 
and Jezebel is symbolizing the church. The servants are symbolizing the ministry of the church. And the, the symbol, the prophecy here is saying that, that during the dark ages, the church becomes a, a woman that is an adulteress. She's not just an adulteress. She entices the ministry to fall into pagan traditions. You find in verse 20, eat things sacrificed unto idols. Right? So in other words, the, the Christian church is going to cause the ministers of the gospel of Christ to fall prey to pagan traditions. All right, and we all know the, 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 the church at that time produced Christmas and Easter and, you know, um, the Eucharist. And, uh, you know, I mean, the list goes on as to how many pagan traditions were brought in by the Christian church. So, and then we find, if you didn't think it was that, verse 24 says, as many as have not this doctrine. <laughs> so, it was specifically speaking about doctrines. In other words, this woman Jezebel enticed the servants of God to partake in false doctrines, false teachings. Right? So, I'm just trying to give you this little precise understanding of that prophecy of Thyatira. So, the spirit of Jezebel is prophesied to be a scourge to the church, would always be a scourge to the church for generations to come. Until the Lord even says that her spirit is present in the Gentile church and that she has caused the church to go into spiritual prostitution. Notice what her plan was. To trap a son of God by painting her face and doing up her hair. Right? That's what she was trying to do in reality to Jehu. Here in the symbol form, according to the symbol spiritually, the church having the spirit of Jezebel would cause the ministry to fall into the fornication of false doctrines because of the church's adulteries with politics and pagan tradition. So what happened during that time is the church became so rife with politics. Remember Constantine joining church and state? The, the church became a political engine to control the world. And they embraced pagan traditions. The, the birthday of the sun god Baal, the birthday of the, the sun god of, of, of the Grecians and the, and the Romans, and that was the, the summer solstice, which was the 25th of December, which, which they converted into the birthday of Christ, which is not even biblical. Uh, Easter, for that matter, which is the, the time of the fertility uh, uh, sacrifices, it is the equinox. Um, where in the Northern Hemisphere they were celebrating the time of fertility, and that is how you got Easter, which comes from the word esterus, which means eggs, which means fertility, which in the, in the, in the European continent, with the Dutch people, uh, came Osterhaus, which is the Easter bunny, where they came up with a painting of Easter eggs. And, um, and I, you know, the traditions go on and on. I mean, most of you know this already. And if you don't know it, it's because probably you haven't heard of it and you're just going along with your church's pagan traditions. But this is the truth. Uh, and the churches accepted all this stuff and felt, you say, but that's not serious. Come on, you know, that's not uh, doctrines. And do you not realize that Easter is calculated by the Catholic Church every year based on the equinox, based on the moon, and the, the, the position of the moon. I mean, who does that? Why are they doing that? Why are they still doing that? Who asked them to do that? Where does this even come from? Why must the world be forced to, to celebrate this, this time called Easter based on the calculations of where the moon is? I mean, is that what God really expects of us? But who cares? It's a harmless thing. Of course, if you start accepting that piece of makeup, you're going to go to the next piece of makeup. Then you're going to get to the eyeshadow, <laughs> where they're going to pull the real wool over your eyes. You know, and the next thing you have is full-blown cover-up of almost every single thing, and you're flirting with a false doctrine. Before you know it, you're in spiritual adultery, and you're lost from the original word of God. Let's read paragraph 118. Sign of the end of the church and the world. 
He says, notice the sons of God. Now he's talking about the days of Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah. The sons of God saw the daughters of men, not daughters of God. The daughters of men, that they were beautiful. Now listen, this is what caused the flood, right? This is what caused the first deluge that caused the first destruction of mankind was because of what sons of God had brought in to the race of men. They, they, they saw the sons of men, the daughters of men, that they were beautiful. So in other words, the, the lineage of Seth looked at the lineage of Cain and remember he said that scientific age, right? Let's read. And it caused the sons of God to fall into this delusion, took them kind of woman and married them and it brought an age of prostitution just like it is today. Like it was in Sodom, like it's predicted to be today. That when men and women of this day swap wives, they don't like this one, they go over to Reno, Nevada and get married, get a divorce, that one and marry again in 15 minutes. And women so pretty, they're almost irresistible. And what is it? The devil. See Satan still in beauty. Notice, notice that sin was never forgiven them. Right? Noah's day. That sin was never forgiven. That pretty scientific age was the very evil age that God destroyed off the face of the earth. That pretty scientific age. Jesus said that it'll be again just before the coming of the Son of Man. That's right. Notice Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And when they all try to marry, now watch the sons of God marry the daughters, the pretty daughters of men, and God never did forgive them for it. So, as it was in the days of Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall it be. Notice what the Bible says. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were fair. Fair. That doesn't mean light-skinned. That means beautiful. So worldly men, I want to point this out, are already corrupted by women, right? Modern day men enjoy women as sex objects. They love the game of dating and dropping one, taking another, not even needing to marry, moving in with someone, sleeping with someone, then the next, then the next. They don't care about spreading venereal diseases and, uh, you know, uh, sexually transmitted infections. They don't care about all that. They just go on and on and on. It's been going on for years till almost every single venereal disease is spreading throughout the world. The feminism movement has empowered this behavior without realizing it. They thought they were setting women free. Oh, let them explore their sexuality. Let them dress how they want to. Let them empower themselves sexually. What a load of nonsense. It did liberate them in a sense. It liberated them to to become naked before the world and uh, think that they're doing good by it. But the long-term behavior they didn't plan for is that man is losing all sense of chivalry and respect for women. Men are addicted to pornography. They are becoming more unfaithful year after year and are losing the original nature of men to care for and provide for women and children. The use of pornography is making them see all women as to behave like what women are staged to behave like on pornographic material. So that now when they come into marriage, they think that that's what women are, are, are supposed to do. They're supposed to do all this nonsense. And so they marry a decent woman and they're expecting them to do the same thing that they view in Hollywood. But if the prophecy of Noah's day is to repeat, then sons of God will fall for the daughters of men again which means it will repeat the demonology of the past. The reason is because they are fair. That means to godly men, women of the world will become more desirable than godly women. Oh my, this is such a tragedy that godly men cannot see past the makeup. Godly men can't see... I mean, you're looking at a woman who is lying to you. That's not even a real face. That's not even a real character. That's not even a real hair. That's not even a real body. It's all made up. Right? And before you know it, it's gone. It's gone. And then you're looking for another made up face. Right? Sons of God who have been called to the ministry will be falling naturally for women. First as a sign that a bigger fall is coming and that the real fall would come. You know, on Monday I heard 
on the radio that there's this pastor in uh, what is this place in Pretoria, and uh, he he used the gospel. Can you believe it? It was called something like the God of Love Ministries, and he's now been uh, convicted of raping I think five or six women in his church, and uh, uh, he told them things like. By him sleeping with them, he was helping them spiritually, you know, get rid of, um, you know, corruption on the inside of them. Or He was, I mean, the man is deranged. But, of, of course, we're not blaming the woman here. Of course, this man is at fault. Of course, this man is a lecherous, you know, somebody who, who doesn't have the Holy Ghost and use the church. Of course. The point is, how did men get to the state? where they can't even respect women in a time where society is so evolved, so educated, yet we've got the most amount of abuse against women, sexual abuse, violence abuse, disrespect for women and children like never before. I mean, somebody has to sit back, wake up and ask the question, why did this happen? How did this happen? Of course, it didn't happen because it's Bible prophecy. Bible prophecy told us this was going to happen because the the Spirit of God could see what men and women were going to do, right? Makeup is a cover-up of reality. If the church becomes more attractive, so now let's talk about the spiritual makeup, right? Now sons of God are falling for spiritual makeup in the churches. How, how do we know? All right, let's see it. Makeup is a cover up of reality, right? There's the definition. If the church becomes more attractive by doing spiritual things to cover up her true personalities, they will corrupt the ministries. If ministries want to be in a church because the church building looks beautiful, because the church music is beautiful, because the church, uh, you know, has wall-to-wall carpeting, air conditioners, all of that. If that's the attraction, well, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to fall to false doctrines. If the church uses fake supernatural signs and wonders, if they use fake gifts of the Holy Ghost, in other words, you've got unrighteous, filthy people speaking with tongues and prophesying and Using spiritual max factor, spiritual makeup, what are they going to do? They are going to draw the sons of God into false worship and make them fall into a bed of spiritual adulteries to teach false doctrines. The churches are just buying from a spiritual max factor inspired by demonology, which they are learning from Hollywood. Hollywood preachers, that's where they're learning it from, right? And when we say Hollywood preachers, you know, Hollywood is actually against Christianity. But we're, we're talking about preachers of America, Europe, Australia, and all these people are not interested in the word. You just start speaking the real word in 15 minutes. They're angry, bored, tired. They don't even want to listen. All they want is, you know, Hollywood religion. They want stages with lights and Beautiful music and uh, a woman up there singing uh, praise and worship. And they're not even righteous people. They don't even care about Christ. They don't even care about the word. They just care about this job they have to do to satisfy this church and all the attention they're getting from worldwide, you know, fans. Let's read about the doctrine of Balaam, paragraph 120. Now we know in Thyatira, The two accusations the Holy Spirit had against the church at that time was the doctrine of Jezebel and the doctrine of Balaam. Paragraph 120. Just the same as Balaam's teaching that he caused the pretty intellectual scientific woman of Moab with their flirty eyes, her paints and powders, her fine perfumes to entice the sons of men against their own women that worked and had calluses in their hands with no makeup, entice them over and let us marry one another because we're all the same people. That was a lie. It was a lie and an achievement of the devil, you see, demonology, to get the sons of God to marry the daughters of men. It was the lie of the devil, demonology. 
for Balaam, that false prophet, to try and prophesy against Moses, that try to hold the race together to say, well, we believe the same God, we offer the same offerings, we have the same sacrifices, we do everything just alike. So, so close that it would deceive the elect if possible. Come away from her, people. You have nothing to do with her. See, Balaam's aim was to, uh, to use a luring woman to cause the sons of God to fail. Remember, he, he came and tried to curse them. He failed to curse them. So this was the successful way. Using women. Remember, he got Balak to invite the Israelites to a peaceful feast. Got them drunk. Brought out the made up girls to make the Israelites fall into fornication against God's law. They died because of that abomination. And Christ warned of it in the church ages. So let's bring this to a close. Is beauty of God? Paragraph 121. God of this evil age. Notice it was not likely that God would interpret his word to Cain's evil generation. No, God would not interpret his word to them. God, the knowledge to make uh, a world so pretty and scientific and sinful, he had to destroy it. Would God do that? Make a world so pretty? Look here, God making his daughters so pretty and would dress them so sexy that his sons would lust after them and would commit adultery? Would God do that? In other words, what? God do a thing like that and then condemn them and then destroy them in a flood? How did this happen? Do you get, do you get the common sense in there? If God made women to be that way, why then condemn them and condemn the men and then destroy them by a flood? Well, obviously that tells us God didn't do that. Men and science produced things to sexualize women. And they caused it. And that was the demonology behind it. Right? So like I told you, women of the world today are under a spell. They don't realize they can have happier marriages if they don't become max factor investors. They don't realize it. They won't even believe it. Because according to them, this is how they must do things to be able to have the dream man of their life. It's a big lie. They don't realize it. The prophet is saying that if, if that beauty was of God, why would he have destroyed it in Noah's day? Therefore, it was not of God. Beauty has always been the trademark of Lucifer. Outward beauty always brings pride. So how can it be of God? Amen. Amen. So, on the contrary, God asks women of the church to dress themselves up differently. And this is the thing about it. You know, we teach this in our churches. And the denominational people make it sound like it's a Branhamite doctrine. It isn't. Just read the Bible, people. First Timothy, second, uh, First Timothy 2, 9. In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. In other words, come to church in a conservative fashion. Shamefacedness. Shamefacedness means a face that is showing humility. This is the Bible. Sobriety. Sobriety means the ability to be sober. Not that you're not drunk. Sober means to think clearly. Right? In other words, go to church with the knowledge. With the knowledge that you are there to serve God and that you are in the presence of Almighty God. Be sober. Be, in other words, be clear of thought that you are not going there to make other men of God fall. You're not going there to flirt. You're not going there to sexualize yourself. Broided hair at the time was sexualizing of women. Gold, pearls, costly array. Ah, uh, saints, you look at the churches today. Uh, listen, this isn't Branhamite doctrine. So I don't, I don't understand. This is just simple wisdom. Wisdom of God, wisdom of the word. People say, ah, oh, the Bible. At first they were complaining about the Old Testament. But here's the New Testament. Ah, the Bible. It's an archaic book. What does it know? You know, God wants you, accept you as you are, come as you are. That come as you are story does not exist in the Bible. 
I don't know who made that. In God of this Evil Age, reading on, he says, This naked, scripted-up bunch of Laodiceans worshipping the God of this world through their ethics and education, shrewdness and prettiness, come out of her, the Bible said. Be not partakers of her sins and don't receive her plagues. God will rain hail out of the sky one day as big as 100 pounds apiece and will destroy her by stoning her like his word always said he done his laws. Well, if God did a thing like that, revealed his word to such a people as that, he'd be defeating his own purpose. God is not foolish. He's the source of all wisdom. So you see where that stuff come from? It come from Satan. And it's still of Satan. And the church has believed it. In other words, the prophet is saying, God's not going to reveal his word. He's not going to reveal the open book to a church that looks like that. To a church that allows its women to dress like a bunch of prostitutes. It's men dressed like hooligans. How is God going to reveal his word to a people who can't even dress themselves decently to handle themselves respectfully? Does it even make sense to a common sense thinking man? No. Neither will it make sense to a spiritual thinking man. God spoke out against the Laodiceans because they were in that horrid condition. Showing then that the condition of the church in the last days will be the same condition as the days of Noah and Lot. He would, not, he would definitely not reveal the word to a church in that condition. He would have to remove his presence from them and spiritually destroy them. Right? False beauty. In Invasion of the United States. In closing, paragraph 70. He says, I want it today. It's just today, the church, we try to send our boys to school to learn psychology. He's talking about the church sending their boys to Bible school. To learn psychology and so forth like that. To know how to put over a program. To get in the pulpit. And the message is so, their message is so enticing. It'll catch the people, catch their attention. Many a great psychologist go out as teachers like that. He's talking about the church, right? The ministries in the church. They're just like psychologists. They're just like they, they have this amazing intellectual program. Um, they know how to woo a congregation. They know how to grab people's attention. They're charismatic. They're, they have great psychological programs, uh, counseling for this, counseling for that, all based on handbooks that they're given. Many great psychologists. I'm reading. Go out as teachers like that, dramatize and put on a whole lot of something. I just wonder, he says, we're always telling of the beauty and the attraction of the church, but we fail to tell them, he that will follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. I wonder if we haven't made the beauty of the church too pretty for the fellow that comes in. For instance, the Baptist church today has got a slogan, a million more in 44. Meaning, they're taking members of the thousands, ten thousands, unconverted just people who walk in and enjoy and join the church. It's an indebtment to the church of Jesus Christ to take such members in. They still drink, they still smoke, they still gamble, they still lie. They come to the church expecting to be entertained by a bunch of Hollywood evangelists. That platform that gets up, put on a, a lot of glamour, a lot of big instruments, setting up and down on the platform when they ought to have an old-fashioned God first crying out, altar call down there where men and women don't come to glamorize or run up and act a clown, but to get down to the altar and realize that the death of Jesus Christ there, that died for them, they're getting back sincere with God. That's what's missing. Church wants Hollywood. What is true beauty, saints? Proverbs 31, 30. Favor is deceitful. Beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. A woman that loves God. A woman that puts the word first. She is beautiful. She is attractive. She is the attractive one to the Son of God. The true Son of God. If we are to be like Christ, we must be simple. If we're a church Right? We're not putting on beauty. We're not putting on Pentecostalism to try and attract people to us. We're not trying to create signs and wonders, miracles, healing to attract people to come to our church. We want people who fear the Lord. We want people who put the word first. If we are to be like Christ saints, 
we must be simple and humble as Christ was. The Bible says he had no worldly beauty that we should desire him. So why should we put on worldly beauty? His beauty was that of a perfect, pure, contrite spirit, which is what really connects us and lasts. Lastly, God hiding himself in simplicity, then revealing himself in the same. Jeffersonville, 1963, paragraph 14. Quote, you all know, the prophet says, Now I think it's our duty to make the inside right by the grace of God. To be so grateful to God that this will, this will not just not only be a beautiful building that we come to, but may everyone who comes in see the beautiful characteristic of Jesus Christ in every person that comes in. May it be a consecrated place to our Lord, a consecrated people, for no matter how beautiful the structure is that we certainly do appreciate, the beauty of the church is the character of the people. I trust it will always be a house of God of beauty. What is the beauty? The character of the people. No makeup is going to bring that, saints. No makeup of demonology is going to make the character of the people beautiful. It's got to be the word. There's no makeup involved. There's no spiritual makeup. There's no spiritual max factor that can turn you into something that looks beautiful to the public. They're going to know. If you put on spiritual Pentecostalism, speaking in tongues, prophesying, you're just a painted face. You're just a painted fire that gives no warmth. The public is going to sense you're just a hypocrite. If you're going to put on fake healings, fake miracles, fake feeding of the poor, fake donations, you're going to do all that. You're just a painted face. You're the biggest cover-up. But if you have the Word, if you love the Word, if you place the Word of God first above everything else, my, you are the real deal. You don't need makeup. Who you are is who they see. And that's the church that takes the stand for Christ in the last day. And that's the church that is not using demonology to control the ministry. Let us endeavor to be that people, saints. Let us endeavor to take the word first. To be the woman, the church, that puts the word first before anything else. Let our beauty be the character of Christ displayed in us. May the Lord bless you saints. Until the next time, be strong in the word. Love the word with all your heart. This is this is proof to us that we need to spend more time in the depths of God's word because that's where our beauty comes from. It's not the beauty of the world. It's the beauty of Christ. The Lord bless you. Amen.